so excited uh, to be here and to share the stage with um, three really great individuals um, that we're going to learn a lot from today. Just before I start, I just want to give Jonathan a really big kudos for saying two things about Canada and the AI space. Number one is we need to win. We need to have that mentality about winning and not just keeping up or not just hoping we're keeping up. We need to think about this from a winning standpoint and that idea of building. We need to build more companies that, that do great things, leveraging AI, but then just plus one on everything Jonathan said to, to kick off. So um, we had a great call last week around trying to decide what conversations we should have. Um, and so I get the opportunity to ask a few questions and listen to these um, people talk about um, how, how we can influence and how we can lead um, the idea of ethical and, and responsible AI. So my first question, um, and I will direct that to Shingai, um, what I'd like to talk about is how do organizations balance this idea of efficiency and, and responsible AI and, and, and ethics around that. Um, I'd love you to use a, an example um, around how companies are, are, are trying to balance this, whether it be job losses or increased productivity or, 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 or challenges within, um, within uh, the, the space where they live. Um, can you talk a little bit about how your company or other companies you've seen are, are trying to do this, have this balance between the ethics and, and the efficiency that AI can, can generate? Yes, good morning everyone. Uh, so my name is Shingai and I'm the head of AI education at a startup called Chain ML. We are a product of the Pan-Canadian AI strategy, so it is working. Uh, three of us uh, out of a team of 10 right now are Vector alumni, and I know there's somebody, from, somebody else from Vector here in the audience uh, today. So we are working with generative AI tools, and we're building generative AI tools, um, specifically in the space of self-service analytics. So the way we do that is we leverage the existing large language models, um, Cohere or OpenAI's chat GPTs, and we build on top of them. And we use what we call agents and chains, which is a smart way to have multiple simultaneous interactions with large language models after one prompt. So you can ask your one question, but you set up agents that have simultaneous interactions with the model. And at the end of those simultaneous interactions, we have a scoring mechanism that gives you ultimately the best response. Now, this is fantastic in a business context in terms of increasing productivity um, in the sense that when we do self-service analytics, you can talk to your data. So you can ask a question in natural language, what were my sales in the last six months? Um, how does that differ to the same period last year? And you should get an accurate response back also in natural language. In the back end, we would have set up those agents and chains to do code retrieval, um, access your database, and do the mechanics of getting you the correct answer. Now, to answer your question around, well, how do we balance that with ethics? You know, this particular use case allows us to start leveraging the large language models taking into consideration things like bias uh, and hallucination, which, which are the big challenges right now. But it's not, uh, it's not uh, uh, mutually exclusive to say that our pursuit of greater productivity um, comes at the cost of responsible AI. We're all seasoned data scientists. We've been in the field for a very long time. We have a commitment to responsible AI. And as we deploy and build these tools, we have steps, including testing for bias, before we deploy um, and before we give products to clients. So in that regard, we've taken it upon ourselves. It's a values-based approach. Right? There's moral, ethical, legal, that's the step ladder. And so right now the bills working their way, is, uh, way up um, are taking care of the legal parts. But as an organization, we've taken an ethical stance to say that this is how we build. We care about bias and we build to accommodate other. Joelle, any, any sort of comments or feedback on, on that? How does Meta use that though, those sense of that balance um, between the ethical part and the uh, and the efficiency and growth that mm -hmm. obviously Meta uses that for, for for many of their products. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great to hear about your your story. Uh, I lead the AI research teams at, at Meta in Montreal. Uh, we have a team, but also globally, and um, we partner with several other teams across the company. So the team that I lead is actually the fundamental AI research team, and often there's you know some work that gets done in fundamental AI research where we. 
build the foundation models. Then there's work we do with applied research teams who take those foundation models and shape them to the needs of specific product and use cases. And finally, there's the product team who are responsible for deploying that on the various platforms that we have. Um, at each phase of this, there's a different level of responsibility in which we engage. And I, I love the framing that you have from moral to ethical um, and, and to uh, the legal side. In our sense, the way I would have articulated is at very early on, we really anchor the work we do in values. So we've identified explicit values in terms of responsibility, in terms of transparency, in terms of uh, collaboration, in terms of excellence of the work itself. As we move forward, closer and closer to the product, we start looking at risks. Because when you can take a specific use case with a specific population in a particular context, then you can start to have a taxonomy for the different risks that may be embedded in those systems. So early on, we sort of build in value into those systems. And as we get into more mature systems, we look at risks such as a bias, such as privacy risks and such as inclusion of toxicity and so on and so forth, hallucinations we've talked quite a bit about today. And when we look at it in such a concrete way, we can actually measure the risks and we can see whether different mitigation techniques that we apply are, ex are helpful in reducing those risks. Now, are those risks to the user, the consumer, or those risks to meta? How do you, how do you balance those risks between their, they might not always be aligned between the risks that you have as an organization versus the risk that the user has from their side? Absolutely, and I think everyone who deploys AI system faces that, that you know, that, that delicate balance between bringing value, real value to, to the organization and to the users, and as well as the risks. And so we do both, and, and many times we see a tension between some of these things. You know, very early on, sometimes we build some, some systems. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pick a specific example. We do a lot of work on machine translation, where we're building systems that can translate from one language to another. It's extremely helpful on all of the meta family of products. It's helpful for lots of other applications. When you build a translation system, there's a question of how faithful are you to the meaning of what's been said? How do you do it in a way that captures the culture of a particular you know, context in which language is expressed? And sometimes you have some, some tension between using certain data sets to train your system to improve the quality of your systems, particularly for rare languages where there's not a lot of data. And so we have to take a stance between what are the data sources that we use and do we have the, the right to use this data in this setting? And so, of course, we, you know, we, we follow regulations um, in, in how much they're present, but there's a lot of questions that fall outside of what's been specified in the regulation. So we try to build that with a broad set of stakeholders who take a look at the technology. Most of the work that we do in research is open sourced. Um, over a decade or so, we've open sourced more than a thousand different libraries, data sets, and so on. And so we get a very fast feedback loop on the research side. And we then use that to feed into the into the product development. Interesting. It's a, it's a great way to, to to bring all the stakeholders together. As you know, as long as that stakeholders group is broad and diverse and and exactly. and all of that. Aleha, how would you like to sort of talk about the balance um, that you've seen between whether they be users and 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 the companies or or the outcomes of some of the efficiencies that are being built with AI? Um, actually, that's um, a great question, and it's crucial to find uh, a balance between the efficiency and ethical use of the AI. As uh, my colleagues, uh, they mentioned, uh, the key point here is uh, measurement and testing the AI system, um, um, measuring the risk associated to each AI system. At New Energy, uh, we uh, have been developing a framework to help the organization to make sure there is a balance between the efficiency of uh, the use of AI and ethical use of the AI. Um, but uh, for, for this reason, our solution is um, putting the guardrails and the governance up early. And for having the guardrails, for defining the guardrails, we need for having the guardrails, 
uh, we need to have use case specific measurement. We cannot uh, define general guide rules for all type of the AI systems. We need to um, take a look on the organization's values. We need to take a look on the stakeholders expectation, the impact level of the AI system, how we are uh, supposed to do uh, to use that AI system. And based on uh, all these factors, we should do some measurement. And, and then the results uh, from this measurement will be uh, a trust score. A trust score on each of the concern and categories that uh, are like the risk around the use of the AI system. For example, for the bias, for transparency. We need to know how transparent, uh, transparent uh, one AI system is. Then we will um, um, generate a trust score for that specific category. And we will have, um, uh, based on uh, this trust score, we will generate a machine trust index for the overall system, for the entire system. And this um, index, this trust index, um, will help us to define the guardrails in the context uh, in which the AI will be used. That's the approach. And like, then we need, uh, for example, I, I want to pick uh, facial recognition technology. We all know that it has um, uh, different uh, capability and functionality in different sectors. But we all know and hear that it's uh, well documented that it exhibits the bias. So what can we do? Shall we stop using the facial recognition technology? But the solution uh, is we can still benefit from the using facial recognition, but by putting the guardrails, we can make sure that we are using that in a safe manner, in like trustworthy manner. That's the point, that the guardrails are important and we need to focus on the guardrails in advance before the using the AI system. So if I can summarize what we do, because I want to make it real, and I, I have an interesting concept. I just had a, a conversation uh, yesterday evening when I came in about this, so this was kind of on the fly. Uh, but we heard about frameworks, about how we, how we sort of look at some of the models. We talked about guidelines, and we talked about uh, guardrails, sorry, and stakeholders, and how do we bring everything together. But in a use case where, because uh, I used to do a little bit of work in this industry of home care, and there's a lot of automation and opportunity to use AI in home care that will create an increase of throughput of, of patients through home care, say 20%, who knows what that is. But let's say there's a tool out there that uses AI that automatically schedules and optimizes around how do you get the right nurses to the right spot and the right time. Um, but then there's Carol. Carol is the lady who schedules all of these people that are there. And there's 50 Carols in these organizations that have to schedule all of these nurses. And Carol's also do other work for the nurses that are there around some of the admin work that happens. So if I can bring a tool that increases the throughput of the healthcare system by 20%, but 50 Carol's lose their job at the same time, how do we balance that real life example of is that ethical as a, as a country or as, a, as, a, as an industry to say, we'll invest in a tool that increases our throughput through the healthcare system by 20%. And part of the impact of that is Carol has, there's 50 less Carols doing work that they're really well suited for. I'd love to hear your feedback around how this works within, um, in a space like that. How do you think about that? How do you use frameworks around that? How do you use guardrails around thinking about a real life example like that? So you wanna make it real? Let's make it real. I joined TV Ontario uh, after I graduated from my master's program at NYU Stern. And in that role, one of the first projects I got was to um, schedule, find the right time to put on a documentary so that it would maximize ratings. And so I built a decision tree. It's nice and visual, easy to explain. And it said Tuesday, 9 p.m. And I sent the email out and CC'd all the right people. And I got an email back in all caps saying, who is your boss? And that email came from someone whose job it was to do scheduling. And that person had multiple Excel spreadsheets with different you know, formulae that linked together and it took time to refresh, et cetera, et cetera. And I had walked in and done someone's job. Uh, in addition to that, it was a unionized role. So it was, there was an additional complication from my having done that task. 
But what you'll realize is that the market forces behind automation, the market forces behind the increase in productivity that we will get, are too great for us to say that we are not going to do it in the spirit of some you know, ethical uh, consideration. Um, and I always use the analogy of if you go back to uh, the advent of electricity, Right, there would have been somebody at the Candle Makers Association, you know, saying that no, we can't use electricity, you know, to, on street number four, the house burnt down, so we need to shut it down. And look, think of all the candle maker jobs that are going to be lost. I think that's the wrong framing. I think we take what we have, and we know certain roles are going to change. They have to change. Again, the market forces will require them to change, and we be proactive. Right? So you know, when I speak to heads of organizations, I say we need to plan for this. And from a Canada perspective, we need to plan for this. Because I always, you know, when I speak to policymakers, I say, I'm from Africa originally. It's very difficult to govern unemployed people. Right? But let's not wait for this to happen. We can see it. We can see slowly some of those efficiency, efficiencies encroaching on certain roles. Let's be proactive about uh, how we try and resolve that. How do we reskill? How do we upskill? Um, and potentially work with those people and human resources communities to understand what the potential is for the problem solving, rather than say, in the name of you know, some sort of ethical consideration, let's stop. We need to pause research for six months to figure this out, as we heard from some people a little while ago. I, I mean, I, I tend to think, you know, that, 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 as you say, that the forces are too great to, to stop this. And especially, you know, the theme this morning that was set was, you know, if we want to win, it, it's not by sitting back and, and it, you know, saying, like, I'm going to take my turn on this technology, like, let AI go by and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll see what comes after. I, I don't think that is a solution. But I think we have to be very realistic about the upskilling that this requires of our workforce. And we have to plan for that as part of the deployment of that. What, one way I've been thinking of a lot of the introduction of these technologies is that it, it really, it's not like it completely displaces human workers. What it does is it really l increases the level of abstraction at which people are working. And you know, some of the tasks that we were doing, instead of you know, us constructing documents and details, you, know, you put in a few ideas, you prompt appropriately, which does require skill and practice. You prompt appropriately, and, and you get much more productive quite quite quickly. Now, I, I couldn't help but think, the, John's example this morning, what happens when then he sends that email to his boss, who then takes this outline, feeds it into chat GPT, and asks, how good is that outline? <laughs> takes the answer, sends it back to John. At some point, this back and forth is going down a, how, a rat hole pretty quickly. And so there <coughs> needs to be injection of human perspective into the system. There needs to be grounding. There needs to be monitoring. There needs to be and analyzing what are the properties of you know the, the the system and and that partnership between the humans and the AI system is going to continue for a long time. The productivity will be increased, but this notion of human judgment, how we balance the tension between different values, is going to be a role that humans have to play in these systems. One of the roles that we have to play is the defining of these terms. What is ethical AI? What is responsible AI? What is AI for good? Because what AI is good for me might be different than you, it might be different, there might be 50 different ways. So Alea, how do we define, how do we start the conversation or to, to, to direct the conversation for the people in this room who many of them are making these decisions or these definitions for responsible AI in Canada, how do we get out in front of this as a country and, and how would you define that or how would you help them define responsible AI or ethical AI as it relates to some of these really difficult questions that we're talking about right now? That's a great question. And, uh, I, uh, uh, I would like to ask this question that can we have one, uh, one size fits all definition for responsible use of the AI? And the, for sure the answer can be no, since the AI behaves differently based on um, where and when and how the AI will be used. The definition of the ethical use in law enforcement is different from the definition of the ethical in the health system. So we cannot have one size fits all definition for AI system. We need to take a look um, on 
where this AI system will be used, what's the intended use, what's the purpose, what's the impact level. And I would say that um, responsible use of AI, it's not just about adhering the upcoming regulation and the policy. All organization and policy also need to look through the eyes of the stakeholders the values that the AI can bring to the public, to the humanity, to the um, um, organizations. We need to um, make sure the definition that we have for responsible use of AI meets all stakeholders' expectation, meets all uh, organization values. It addresses all risks and benefits around the use of AI system. It's comply with the regulation that can be a definition for the responsible uh, use of the AI. Run the risk of making a word salad around these definitions because we're trying to accommodate everything or everyone. How might they be able to thread that needle between all of the balances that are that, that are that all the balancing they have to do around the different stakeholders? How, do, how, do, how does one go ahead and start to try to thread that needle around some of these definitions? Um, we need to dig down uh, on the characteristics of the AI system, right? To see the type of the AI system. Is it generative AI or it is traditional AI? And how it's supposed to be used? It's for public use or it's for internal use for the organizations? And what's the impact level of that use? Are we going to use it, um, the AI as assistant, or are we rely, uh, relying on the decision that makes by the AI system? We need to take into the account all these factors in order to define the practices that should be followed by the organization, by the developer, when they are developing or deploying and managing the AI system. We need to take into account all this consideration. If I can add, uh, from a policy perspective, we have seen some success with um, uh, initiatives like the algorithmic impact assessment tool. And that is sort of using the same trust framework or the risk framework that says what is your tool going to be used for and then therefore you can make an assessment about its impact and whether or not and how to use it. So we have some policy instruments that have started to come about to help us deal, uh, uh, deal with the question. Um, but fundamentally, once again, this is hard work that we all have to do. And if we think back to a time, again, just as electricity was uh, uh, becoming more mainstream, before, if you look at your laptop or any device, a microphone, they all have labels now that say, you know, don't take this to the shower, don't make toast in the shower. And it took time for us to get there. But where we are in the artificial intelligence story is we're right at the beginning. So we have to do that hard work of standardization. And it, it, will, it will take time. There will be some word salading that will take place. But in the meantime, from an industry perspective, we're going to continue the work of building. And it might be responsive. But again, I always advocate for let's be proactive. That's the only way that we can try and see ahead. So just this week, uh, President Joe Biden announced an executive order to educate key departments within the US about AI. And it's like, get your shit in order. This is happening. Let's be aware of this, right? And right now, currently, the UK is having a summit that's got key leaders within not only industry, but actually world leaders at the table really talking about this. Um, I'm curious to, to hear, Joelle, who should do it? Who needs to govern this? Jonathan talked a little bit about what would we talk to ourselves 25 years ago in the 90s when the internet came in. Whose job is it to moderate and to govern the definitions and the roles that, that AI plays in our life? I mean, down the line, the, the role of governance will be held by you know, elected officials, but, but the conversation has to happen with multiple stakeholders. And so you know, we're very early on in the conversation. And so that means we need to have many people participate from that point of view. 
you know, I looked at the executive order. I think it's about 100 pages or so. And, and, and you know, I think I there's... I tried to read it last <laughs> yeah. night before I was going to happen. There's a lot of good content in there, but there's a lot of things that are, that are very untested. You know, just to pick one simple example, I think they tried to put a limit on the number of operations, like flops, that you can use to train a particular model. Well, yeah, when you talk to the people implementing the models, the ability to count the number of flops for a particular model, the question is, well, is it the final model we trained? Or is it the model that we train to know what model to train in the end, or the research that we did to know what model to train to? So, you know, there, there's some sometimes some key implementation details that that make this a hard measure to comply with, even if we, you know, if we if we choose to. That's okay. It starts the conversation. It gives us concrete guidance to react to and to test the feasibility of doing. I've seen other guidelines that have asked for watermarking of generative AI systems. Great, watermarking gives you an ability to essentially add a signature that may be invisible to a content to authenticate the provenance of that content. We have a good idea of how to do watermarking in images. We don't have a good idea of how to do it in language or in speech. And so that opens up concrete research questions. And so at the stage that we are, what's really important is to start piloting some of these ideas, to get concrete proposals, whether they come from government, whether they come from civil society, whether they come from research group, and start piloting these things to look at the feasibility, and also to look at whether they're meeting our objectives in terms of minimizing risk on individuals and society. Um, one organization that I particularly, uh, whose work I really support is the Partnership on AI. This is an organization that is a global organization. Um, it, um, it is led by Rebecca Finley, a proud Canadian based in Toronto, um, who came through the, the, who was a member of CIFAR for many years, implemented our Canadian AI strategy. It is taking a broad group of stakeholders. It produced a few different documents, including some guidelines on the use of synthetic media, guidelines on safety and openness for research models and so on. So it's one of many organizations that is neither a government or a company or affiliated with a specific group and really broad stakeholders. There are others, and I think at this stage, really the spirit is to engage with respect to concrete proposals, pilot this, get the feedback, learn as fast as we can what works and what doesn't. Any other comments? Well, on, on education, I'm biased. That's my role is head of AI education. So um, I, I think it's the first and most important thing that we can possibly do. Um, just, you know, my colleague from Mila is here, uh, Anna Jan, she's going to be on a panel later. Um, I'm actually teaching a course in their program for policymakers to, to, to learn about artificial intelligence. And one of the um, initial discussions was, do we include code? And I absolutely insist that we do in that programming so that we avoid instances where a policymaker is trying to reg create regulation and policy, but their relationship with AI is not that this is rows of code, right? So once my belief certainly is that once people really grasp that, you know, you're, you're regulating a person with a laptop and an internet connection and maybe a data set, then when we say things like the right to be forgotten, what does that actually look like? Are we fishing the row with your data in it out of the database? Are we taking your face out of the facial recognition training model? And are you forgotten? Because the models remember, right? So it's really important, I think, that the, the education and literacy happens, and it happens to the extent of actually exposing policymakers and leaders to code. Well, um, that's a tough question. <laughs> uh, who and at, at what level of control uh, should have around uh, the AI? Since um, it depends of um, the AI landscape where we're using the AI. We cannot like say for this AI system, the organization should control or the government, or the public, or the stakeholder. We need, uh, as uh, you mentioned, we need a pilot program, right? To see which of these approaches will work well for different like AI system. Sometimes we need to um, look through um, the stakeholders' expectation, the benefits, and then based on that, we need to uh, determine the level of the control and who should control that AI system. That's One of the things that was said earlier was this idea of adopt, 
And I think one of the really important parts of this discussion around governance is understanding what it is and how it works for real. So I would encourage everyone to adopt as much of this technology as you can so you understand what you're trying to govern, what you're trying to understand what's part of this. Because if you don't understand it, if you don't adopt it as a, as a country, as a, as a company, um, you don't know what you're, you don't know how it works. So how would we encourage our policymakers here to start to adopt the, 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 the tools that are there? And as you answer this, Joelle, I'm going to get my phone because I know the questions are coming in through text that I forgot it. So I'm going to go do that. <laughs> and then please answer about that. Yeah, how, do, how do policymakers start to adopt these tools to get a better sense of what's, what's next? I mean, what's been you know fascinating over the last year is just how the barrier to adoption has suddenly dropped. I think for for many years, you know, to be able to adopt AI, you really needed like an AI research team on site to to guide you and take you through that. Now, the number of tools that we have that are easily freely accessible is is very very large. And so, whether it's you know text conversation through chat type of systems whether it's image generation systems. I think there's a lot of questions we didn't get into in terms of you know, generating synthetic images and videos and the impact of that, the quality of that generation of synthetic voices and so on, where there's a lot of challenges between that. In some cases, synthetic voice generation is a wonderful tool to allow you to do translation with the expressivity of your own voice. In other cases, it can be used to generate false information and, and impersonate you. So, just really getting your hands on that technology and playing with it is great. One way to do it is, you know, talk to the teenagers in your lives. They have their hands on this technology. They will take it out for you. They'll give you a, <laughs> they'll give you a tour. Um, I think that's one of the best ways to know it. In many ways, the, the technology that is being built today, like we are having the conversation and we are trying to figure out how we will integrate this in our lives and our society. But it's really the next generation that is going to be carrying both the promise and the burden of that technology. I have four teenagers at home, so I see it every day. And I do try to see it through their own eyes and, and to see what is their experience with that technology, which is very different from mine. Really interesting. So we've got two great questions, and we've got a few minutes to go through here. So um, the UK Prime Minister, Rishiki Sundak, um, just was quoted yesterday saying that AI companies should not mark their own homework. You can't tell us what's good about the stuff you already created or what's good or bad or, or biased. So um, how do you react to that, that comment that AI companies can't mark their own homework? It, it makes complete sense to me that it's, it's, it's logical. Um, and for a while, I've been suggesting that, well, why don't we have um, the opportunity for a Canadian citizen to go to a government body to say, hey, I feel like a tool has been, you know, has been biased. I didn't get the bank loan. And by the way, I check a lot of boxes where I wouldn't get the bank loan, black, female, Africa, etc. So it would be wonderful to have a place to go to that is formalized and it's part of the Canadian um, infrastructure to say, I believe this has happened and get recourse, right? So there has to be that infrastructure baked in. And in addition, those task, force, task forces should be set up to start proactively dealing with the skills um, and the workforce implications of artificial intelligence. So it makes sense that we would have some sort of external oversight with people that are qualified researchers who can you know, have a conversation with the researchers who built a model to say, can you explain to us how this might have occurred and get substantive answers versus the PR line that says, well, our algorithm is dynamic and it couldn't be biased, and that's the end of the story. I think in light of that, you know, I think one thing we didn't discuss a lot is the, the aspect of transparency yeah. around these systems. And, and I have to confess, one of the things I've been most worried about in some of the conversations on AI risk is is the line of thought that says that we need to keep all of this closed and put it behind closed doors and can't let it out. because that doesn't give us the ability to essentially you know, have a wide group of people look at the technology and, and, and you know, assess how it's performing. And so I think that's one thing to be very careful about. We have to remember that we are very on, early on in the journey of AI. There is so much to go. So if we close it down behind closed door today, we don't permit a wide number of people to assess, to evaluate, to mark the work. 
and that is going to cause us some deep trouble down the road. So I think we have to be very careful on this issue of transparency. If anything, I would you know, lean into the direction of transparency early on so we can have this ability to have a much broader set of people evaluating. It does feel a little bit like trying to push the toothpaste back in the bottle, though, in, in, in some cases here on the transparency side. So, I, But I think it's a really important part. You, you sound like a candle maker. Yeah. Say that. <laughs> Fair point. Um, Alea, last question here is um, you have a, a wonderful framework around guardrails. Um, how do you test for bias within these guardrails? How do you include bias testing within um, our evaluation of, of models and outputs uh, from our AI systems? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, bias is uh, one of the key concerns around each AI system. We are using um, uh, AI trust tools, um, lots of uh, AI tools um, exit outside, and then we are uh, doing some measurement, and based on the use case objective, we try to convert the measurement to a trust score based on the type of the use, the objective, the objective of the use of the AI system. We convert the measurement, the metrics that we um, measured into a trust score. It's not one, um, um, one metrics. We need to consider different factors around that, how it's supposed to be used. Are we uh, are relying on the, that decision or not? Is there, mm, we, we need to take um, a look into the training data set, the output of the system, the way that it's supposed to be used. And for each of these, we will have a trust score. That can we trust if this system um, exhibit the bias or not? For example, for facial recognition, if uh, facial recognition technology or facial recognition in that model exhibits the bias against one demographic group. And if the objective of the, um, for example, um, um, it's biased against female, right? And it might not be uh, a bad thing for us. If we want to use that system where we want to use the AI system for like that the target group is male, right? Then we will have a higher trust score. However, it's like it's biased toward the female, but it's good to be used for male, right? Then we will have a high trust score on the bias. Then we, we would say that uh, this uh, system behaves fairly on the male group that it's our target group, then that's why we need to do measurement based on the use case specific. We cannot go in general and say the bias is a bad thing. Sometimes we need to have bias in the system to have a higher accuracy on the targeted group. It goes back to transparency of the data and the model, not just the model, not just how it's being put, but the data sets that, that these are being trained on as well. Right. There's been a lot of conversations about that in the past. Um, I want to say thank you um, to our three panelists for sharing your insights and allowing me to ask a, a few questions and be part of this event today. Thank you, everyone, as well, for putting in questions and, um, and, and being part of this conversation because it it's really important to, um, to have these today and to be able to share some of the insights with uh, these three. So thank you very much.